Ward, Andrew is called for surgery. Once in theatre, Ms Cassidy will administer Botox into his limbs. Andrew is a little boy who has cerebral palsy, so he has some undue tightness of his lower limbs and tends to walk on his toes. We have him on a physiotherapy program. If that's sufficient for children, we won't do anything more. If that is not sufficient to get them comfortably walking with their feet flat on the ground, we give them some Botox to relax their muscles a little bit. Yeah. Into his jersey, so we'll just lose it. Can you swing around, Dad? I'll tie that. It's hard to let them go, like, you know. But uh, it won't be too long now. 20 minutes will be all over, hopefully. Would that be nicer? Cerebral palsy is a condition which interferes with your uh, walking and your balance and your muscles and even your sensory system. So the range of children we see with cerebral palsy is vast. We see children you would hardly recognize them, hardly recognize as they walked down that there was any problem with them, to the children who are severely affected are never going to walk and need total care. And then we have children in between who can get around but have a little bit of difficulty. So we try and make it as easy as possible for them to get around. Botox eases their muscles or relaxes them a little and makes it easier for them to walk or easier for us, for us to fit splints on them. Giving the Botox is actually very simple. It's just like getting a vaccination. Uh, it's a drug that we uh, put into their muscles and it helps to relax them. The bit that's a little bit harder is to examine each child, see which muscle they particularly require it into and set up then to actually do the treatment for them. I was wondering what I was keeping him when he wasn't coming back. So. Yeah. No, Dave has to do that. I couldn't go down, down with him. I'm a basket case. It's bad <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I'm glad now he's gone in and he'll be back in half an hour. Is that what you said? Yeah. Half an hour. Yeah. yeah. Twinkle, twinkle. Meanwhile, Michaela and Sophie have been on dialysis for almost three hours. For their parents, the hope of one day receiving a transplant is foremost in their minds. And downstairs, one little boy who has recently undergone such surgery has arrived for a checkup. Joseph is a patient who required dialysis at home every night. So literally seven nights a week, parents had to put him on the machine for, in the end, what ended up being 16 hours sometimes. He had no urine output, so he was restricted on how much fluid he could drink. 500 mils may sound okay, but that included literally any fluids that went into, say, cornflakes, into a cup of tea, jelly, soup, all of that gets included. So for a child to be told constantly that you just can't drink what you want to drink, it becomes a battle between the parents and the child. Okay. Obviously, if, you, if your day, if 16 hours of your day is taken up with dialysis, it doesn't leave a lot of time for real life to happen. So school, play, parents have to work. It has a massive impact on the whole family. Waking up every morning, as I said, after 16 hours or 18 hours of dialysis, facing a lot of tablets to take, not being allowed to take a huge amount of drink with it, and then to try and get him to get the energy to go to school. Um, you know, he, he did all the hard work. He had to go through that day in, day out for a number of years before he was lucky to get his transplant. We were told that um, it would prob probably be a call in the middle of the night, and true to form was about, um, I think, about a half, half 12. You just go up, get up, and you go, they just tell you. Got his childhood back. It's great for the um, the other children. It's great for him. It's great for us. But as I say, he's um, he's a wee character that grabs life by the scruff of the neck anyway, and it's good to see him taking that chance. As the day nears an end for Michaela and Sophie, their parents look to the journey ahead and the prospects of freedom which a transplant will bring. She never complains about it. The only time now and again she might say, oh, I wish I had a new kidney, I could go swimming or I could go do this and that with the other kids. Like, and you kind of get used to coming up, even though, as I say, it would be great if we didn't have to be coming up. Like, you know, Michaela would have a more normal life. She's the most popular um, blood group, so that's a good start, you know. So, um, can basically go on the waiting list and wait to get the call. Hopefully, you know, people actually, you know, do sign the, the care. It means an awful lot, you know, to get that. I guess someone don't know, don't know to a kidney to you.
So hopefully she will get the transplant, you know, that we need so badly. Because if she got the transplant, I mean, it would be brilliant. It would be a whole new lease of life for her and for us as well, of course. I would never have thought of signing the card until this happened and now, you know, anyone I'd say, you know, sign your card because it means life to someone else after us. Downstairs in the laboratory, the results of Jack's test have been finalised. In Jack's case, we were able to very quickly confirm the presence of the meningococcus, the, the bacteria that is um, one of the commonest causes of bacterial meningitis. Uh, this particular strain of meningococcus is what's known as a type B strain. Type B is the, the commonest type of uh, meningococcus that, that we see in Ireland. It's a strain that's very readily treated with antibiotics, and in most cases, children do very well. Now, unfortunately, there is a small number, there are a small number of children that even when we're able to make the diagnosis, even when they're started on antibiotics early, can develop complications, and unfortunately, a small proportion of children do still die from meningitis, and that's why it's really important that we're able to diagnose it and treat it as quickly as possible, and hopefully to uh, develop further vaccines to prevent it. Jack is transferred to the St. Patrick's Ward, where he continues to receive treatment. And while he sleeps, his dad waits by his bedside. Luckily enough, when we brought him in force, they, they treated him for it straight away without really knowing what it was. They knew it like it was some sort of infection, so luckily enough, they treated him straight away for that. And we got him in early, that was the main thing as well. The nurse came around and says that they, there was a lot of white uh, blood cell build up on, on the back of his spine, so that's how they knew that they knew what it was. But uh, again, we're getting him in early. That, that, that's all they were saying, get him in early. Once you got him in early, was the best thing you could have done. And he just went from being perfect Sunday morning to nothing at all, just asleep. Tried giving him a drink. He took the drink, but it was coming straight back up. Luckily, Jack was picked up quickly, treated very promptly, but it can go wrong as well. Even despite early treatment, it's an unpredictable and serious illness. And, you know, there's a not insignificant uh, rate of death with the condition. In this situation, I think both Jack's parents were very clued into the idea that he wasn't himself at all, that they noticed a rash. They clearly thought this rash was something that they'd not seen before, and they responded very quickly to it. It's unbelievable, like, thinking of it now, like, me and, me and her would be saying, God, thank God we brought him in, thank God we brought him in early, because it was the best thing we could have done for him. The worst thing is seeing that child in that, in that kind of state, I wouldn't like to wish it on anybody. Andrew is back from theatre. The surgery went very well. Again, he's a very happy child who was quite okay going to theatre. He was a little um, unsettled when he came back and his temperature was a little up, but that settled again once he's had his drinks and something to eat. The high temperature in itself is, un is unusual, but there's nothing to say that a child cannot develop that. <laughs> In some cases, the Botox works quite well. It might work for a year, it might work for three months, it might work for six months, and it varies child to child, so that's why they're reassessed. They usually have a care program anyway. Botox to, should just make their general care easier for the children who are more severely affected. Yeah, it's like walking on the moon. <laughs> they call them his moon shoes, don't they? He'll be doing moon moon moonwalking next, right? So it'd be delighted to be going home, Andrew. It's been a long day, but we're at last we've got home. You can still do physio with it. They can still work with physio on it with these on them. But we have physio all the time anyway, so to continue with it, just... Mostly um, stretching. Stretching exercises. On the muscle, like, to get us healed down. Just, you know, the Botox just gives it more, uh, like a rubber band, makes it stretch more, like... You know. Glad it's all over? Yes. OK.
Next time on Temple Street Children's Hospital. The cast wasn't working the last time, so she had to go into traction. Let's go. He's been getting quite a lot of infection. We know today now whether it's going to be long term.